power, which is the story of black people all over the world. <laughs> uh, so, so, so we, we as, as a result of our challenges with power, we remain voiceless yeah. for a little while. Or at least uh, mute the voice. And now we are back. Um, so apologies for the for the power issues, but uh, we have a generator. <clears throat> Let me just very quickly um, welcome you all to uh, to this conference over the next two days on uh, teaching Palestine. And uh, I'm not going to go into a long um, welcome or speech because uh, we are running late already. Um, I feel obligated to make a nasty comment because I usually do when it's an event that uh, we didn't organize. Uh, so I, I feel that I should do that when it's an event that we organized as well. Johannesburg has really very good quality water. There's really no reason why we should be serving people bottled water. It's very bad for the environment. And, um, and I'm very disappointed that an event that we're organizing, we have not thought to provide jugs. Um, so, uh, Selim, you should invest in some jugs. It will be cheaper and uh, better for the environment. And uh, it's not just any bottle of water, it's Nestle, which is one of the worst companies in the world. Um, and should not only be boycotted, but worse than that. And since this is going to go on YouTube, I'm not going to say what worse means. Okay, that's my rant for the day, hopefully my rant for the week. Um, thank you for that, for listening and being of such good humor. Um, let us get straight into the first session, which is the keynote session. And with a, with a theme for the conference like Teaching Palestine, isn't it wonderful that our keynote speakers are the three R's? Um, <laughs> Ronnie Castro, um, Robin Kelly and Rabab Abdul Hadi, and they will speak in that order. Uh, from South Africa, the United States, and Palestine, uh, respectively. I'm not going to um, speak to their bios because they are in your folders that you have. Um, but um, let, let's begin immediately. Thanks. Right, thanks so much, Naeem. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here with our two wonderful activists doing so much internationally. Welcome here. I'm actually here not really to speak. I'm here to listen to the two of you. And then what happens? They say to me, Ronnie, please speak first. <laughs> I was going to speak third. I don't know which of the R's I am. Um, maybe reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> anyway, I'm also really pleased to see so many good faces in the audience from all over. 20 minutes, so prod me when I've got two minutes left, please. Starting now. No. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we've got a wonderful couple of days ahead and the program has been crafted so well in terms of areas of focus. So, start with Vietnam. And I'm using Vietnam, which we studied when we were in the forests, and I'm referring not just to the ANC of South Africa, but to the MPLA, Frelimo, the Zimbabwean comrades, Namibia, etc. We were, of course, inspired in the 60s by, as everybody was, the Cuban Revolution, Act in Benfieu, etc and of the Americans, as we know. And we crafted this, reduced the experience into what we called five fighting factors. So I want to just refer to them in the introduction. I've had many discussions with Palestinian comrades in this respect. But um, the, the, these factors are quite universal through the ages. It doesn't mean that you win necessarily with the factors. And they depend on the balance of power internationally, which can change radically, incidentally. You know, in 1956, when Israel, France, and Britain 
invaded Egypt to seize the Suez Canal. At that particular point, it was US imperialism that was not happy and basically forced them to retreat. We know very well that the US had designs on supplanting the former colonial empires and had those reasons. Today, we've got a situation fraught with the dangers of war in which the balance of forces internationally seem incredibly stacked against revolution, against change, against Palestinian struggle, against the Venezuelans, against what we are able to do in South Africa. And incidentally, the Black Panther movement of the US is another example of the inspirational factors of, of the 60s. The five elements that are referred to is firstly, just struggle, just war. And it doesn't mean armed struggle necessarily, but it's just struggle. And the point that the Vietnamese Ho Chi Minh Jap used to point out is we're fighting a just war, and that means we have moral superiority over the enemy. It's a key factor. Then there's an element of correct theory and strategy. I know there might be comrades here who, when I say the next thing, will say, yeah, well, South Africa doesn't exemplify this. But with it, they talked about correct leadership. So it's tried and tested leaders who the people have faith in, who have shown that they've served the cause, and they've developed out of their experience the, the best possible theoretical strategic approach in the struggle. Third element, but actually with the first, the just struggle factor, is the most important. A united, determined people. And we know how important it is to fight for the unity of the people. The Palestinians have plenty of determination, samut as they call it. I think it's exemplary, and if there's time I'm going to end on it at the, at the end of my 20 minutes. But a united people, a determined people. And in relation to that comes a key element that we're studying today, and that's conscientizing, mobilizing, organizing awareness. Um, the next element, I think I'm on the fourth, am I? The fourth. And, and Jean pointed out at that stage, fighting US imperialism with its nuclear weapons. He said, we've got a more powerful weapon than the nuclear bomb, and that's people's war, guerrilla struggle. Um, but what I would add here, because we don't impose a line and say it's got to be armed struggle, we know and understand at times there's non-violent or peaceful forms of struggle and so on. Um, but in, in terms of what he said, the people's war, the Vietnamese, as we came to understand, we made huge errors in the whole of Southern Africa and, and the ANC did as well, a militarist approach, one in which didn't link political organization and mobilization with the use of arms. So really we're talking here in this fourth element about the correct assessment of the methods of struggle. What are the best methods of struggle? The fifth one is so vital. Ho Chi Minh kept emphasizing it. International solidarity. And out of the South African struggle was born BDS and the Palestinian struggle out of civil society, by the way, because the leadership there have been pusillanimous, have not come to the fore as the ANC did right to the fore to say we need to have international solidarity on our side. We need South Africa to be isolated, to be boycotted, divestment, sanctions, and that became a very major form of pressure in the South African struggle. And that obviously is a key element for those of us as then in the South African struggle, as now in the Palestinian struggle, who aren't involved in the theater of struggle in Palestine,
but internationally. And the Vietnamese were able to mount tremendous support and we could see how vital that was all over but in the United States of America in the belly of the beast. And it, it's so vital to the aspect of isolation is where we call for boycott, etc. is the pressure, not just on Pretoria now, not just on Tel Aviv, but the supporters, the governments who support those regimes and the pressure of the, the anti-apartheid movement of our day was so great that we found the creation of chinks in the armor and a key element was when the basically the black lobby, African American lobby in Congress enforced on the Americans the three triple A's, the anti-apartheid act against Reagan's position. Um, so that's a summing up of, of the five. How much time we got? Ten, okay. So in the next ten minutes, I'm just going to breeze through what I feel um, are key elements that we should focus on. There are so many, but these are key elements, I believe, in terms of fighting for our ascendancy, fighting for our narrative, because everything I'm talking about relates to the narrative. It relates to your narrative universally and to your own people. Never believe that even, incidentally, your leaders understand and stick to the narrative. I, I'll quickly tell you this, when I was a minister here, uh, and we had a government that was marginally better than the Zuma government, it wasn't so corrupt, and Mbeki and his foreign minister, and Kosuzana Glamini, she showed great boldness, she was the first person to lead a delegation to see Arafat after the bombing of, of his headquarters, etc. But I used to sit with the three key people in terms of trying to get South Africa, the government, to BDS, those Bs in Tel Aviv, if you know what a B is, okay. I'm using a crude word for that. Anyway, um, and I used to sit at night, I lived next door in Becky on the government estate. They didn't understand anything about the word Z. That's the problem. Who understands Zionism? You ask yourselves, we do. We study it. But you can go to people in power. You can go to so many people. Zionism, oh yeah, well, you know, that's in the Bible, Zion. Yeah, you know, that's the problem because the guy up there said that the guys, you know, the Jews can, that's their land. And we know how absolutely comical this is, but my goodness, it really has traction. And I was listening to Chomsky the other day on a YouTube, and he was taking people back in history um, to Balfour, to Woodrow Wilson, to these guys, and right through to Truman, Stian, who knows this so well, and saying, that these people were biblical fundamentalists, right through to Truman. They, their bedside reading wasn't playboy. Trump's might be playboy, but their biblical reading is the Bible. And we can see what we're facing today, even in this country, because we have a very powerful Christian grouping of our African people who rebelled against the organized Christian church and organized independent African churches called the Churches of Zion. Because Zion to the black oppressed, and you have this in the States, don't you, is powerful. This is the call to the people that we will see Jerusalem and so on. Very powerful in this country. The way it's played out today is the evangelists are using this for their dream 
of the Armageddon. Let's all the Jews get into damn well Jerusalem and Israel and we'll have a, the second coming. And it's powerful if you believe in that fundamentalism. So I, I find that we haven't really tackled it. You see, if you want to start tackling biblical myths, did Moses really exist? Shlomo Sand in the invention of the Jewish people shows otherwise. Go to Egypt, and without reading Shlomo Sand, as someone with a Jewish background, you look around, the, the temples there, the hieroglyphics, this is the record of every pharaoh. They want every single thing they achieved written down. You won't find a reference to Moses or the Exodus at all. But when I've tried to open this up, I have found very much, by the way, Naim, with Muslim friends, you know, because Moses is a prophet. And if we take these things as it's been taken fundamentally today, then you're caught up as a Becky, as is Pahad, and of course Azama were to quite a degree, not fundamentalist, but to this idea that, well, you know, the place, after all, this is the home of the Jews. We now visited for the first time biblical Palestine, and I was taken to Kalkilia, and I was welcomed by the mayor, who said to me, welcome to our Canaanite town. Canaan. Did the Lord God really reserve some land for the Jews? My reading of the Bible was that actually they sent in spies to Canaan to find out how powerful or weak they were, and then they overthrew the Canaanites and expelled them. So the Canaanites are the originals. Then you read Shlomo Sand, and you begin to realize, my God, in my blood, do I really carry the blood of the Hebrews? Who are the Palestinians then? They are people in the area who were once like the Hebrews, pagans. And then the idea, and there's interesting reasons why, the idea of a deity unity God came. And that you go to Egypt and you'll find that out. It's already with with that one pharaoh, I, 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 I can't remember the name of that. Um, and the, you see the idea of moving from paganism to believing in one God was an empire building element to unify people in behind one God. Okay, we're coming to two minutes. Um, so it, it becomes so fascinating because actually I think, and it's Shlomo Sand is showing this, a lot of Israeli scholars even, what Palestinians know, is that you people and this guy, if in fact my family line does go back that far, it comes out of Lithuania, the original people were the Canaanites. They didn't disappear. They converted. They converted to Judaism. <laughs> then along comes a guy called Jesus of Nazareth, and then there are the key reasons, sociological and so on, why you have the move to Christianity. So they convert to Christianity. <laughs> then we get to the Muslim era, and there's the conversion that takes place. So who are the Jewish people, the Israeli state, killing off, driving out, and doing all sorts of abominable things to, up to genocide? Oh, actually, I would say the original people in Palestine who at one stage became Jewish and then went on and on. Okay, I think my time's complete. I was going to go through a number of other elements of the narrative, like how we need to debunk Zionism. It's a colonial settlement project, and the, the, the colonial settlement goes with extremism, racism, ultimately fascism, if it's not stopped. And that's the way they're going with the only Jewish state. Just to mention, 1948, December 4th, the New York Times publishes the letter by Einstein and Hannah Arendt, warning against Menachem Begin, who's come to New York to collect money 
for his new party, which we now know as Likud, which is Netanyahu's party, and they say, don't trust this man. He's massacred people at Deir Yassin. Their whole program is fascist. If this man is not stopped, that's the way it's going to go in Israel. Prescient. That's the way it's gone. So we've got to get to grips constantly exposing that agenda. And then it's what we face in the world today. Sorry to take two minutes. It's the greatest threat that we face in decades. It's the United States alliance with Israel. And this can really detonate the world war. We can see and we well know United States designs from Latin America and Cuba and Venezuela to the Ukraine to the new NATO up to the gates of Moscow again um, and of course the Palestinian issue, Iran, Syria. It's absolutely getting to that point of midnight which is why we have to do everything we can to expose. We can do it through BDS. I wanted to end on saying that what the Palestinians have at what looks like such a bleak time is some wood. And when you can see the march of return, which is so heroic, and the example symbolically of the young girl Ahad Tamimi standing up to punch the Israeli soldier and being prepared to go to prison. We now see Elad Omar, the changes in America, and this is such cause for tremendous feeling that it can be done. That's a key thing to get across. We can't put our heads down, we can't bow our knees to US imperialism and its partner in the Middle East, Israel, we have to stand up, we have to speak out, we have to come together in organizations, in movements, in discussions at all levels, and we've got the wonderful weapon of BDS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, in, in retrospect, maybe I should just introduce the speakers. Um, <coughs> Ro Ronnie is, sorry, I don't have to introduce you. Okay, let me introduce Ronnie. I, I, oh, let me do an outro for Ronnie rather than an intro. Um, Ronnie, his most important position, is, of course, is that he's the, the provi provincial chairperson of this province of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Less important is that he's the former Minister of Intelligence, um, and before that, Minister of Water Affairs and Forestry, and before that, Deputy Minister of Defense. This is all, of course, in, the, in democratic South Africa post-1994. Uh, Mandela's government and then uh, Thabo Mbeki's government. And before that, uh, he was in, in exile um, and a commander in, uh, in the ANC's armed wing Konto Resizwe, trained in the Soviet Union. Um, yeah, that's enough? Good, thanks. Our, our next speaker is Robin Kelly, and despite your protestations, Robin, um, <laughs> Robin is an author and historian. I think everyone knows him, but nevertheless. Um, a distinguished expert in African American studies and a celebrated professor who's lectured at some of America's foremost learning institutions. He's a professor of American studies and ethnicity at the University of Southern California, been to South Africa many times and so familiar with all the Americans and the South Africans and others. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I was saying, no I, I have a very short period, and I have, I have decided to write something, so I'm going to read it. Before I say that, though, I'm so proud to be part of the three R's. Um, but you have to imagine my horror when I got off the plane last night and met you know, my the driver of the shuttle, who's hiding, so, holding up a sign that said R. Kelly. So, so I'm not making that up. So people start to gather, like, is this R. Kelly? We're going to get a beat down. I'm like, no, not that R. Kelly. So it's a true story. OK, so it's really fitting to be here in South Africa, one of the most important places in my life, uh, to be here with Rabab, with members of our delegation. We were in Palestine a year ago um, to think about emancipatory pedagogies, uh, to be here at the invitation of our South African comrades, uh, Malatse, uh, uh, 
There's also um, Nasli and Matidiso, um, Matidiso and among others. And so to share the podium, of course, with the legendary uh, Ronnie Castro. Um, and also to be here with Celine Valley, who's thinking about education and struggle, especially in a post-apartheid context, has not only informed my own reflections on teaching Palestine, but on pedagogy and social movements as a whole. Um, I was privileged to contribute to a book that Valley and Aziz Chaudhry uh, put together titled Reflections on Knowledge, Learning, and Social Movements, History, Schools, which makes a really compelling case for struggle as a school. So in that spirit, I want to offer some reflections on how the history of African-American, Palestinian solidarity dating back to 1967 really disrupts or calls into question a, a politics of analogy that often dominates the framework for thinking about and teaching solidarity, especially after the Ferguson-Gaza uh, moment in 2014. Activists there you know, highlighted the similarities in state violence, uh, the racialized histories, histories of dispossession uh, and enclosure and tactics of popular resistance. And now while this is certainly true, and there's a lot of truths in these analogies, um, analogies can sometimes lead to historical distortion uh, and muddle political intentions. So a case in point, of course, is a Palestinian freedom fighter, freedom riders rather, in 2011, who inspired by the 50th anniversary of the freedom rides organized by CORE, of Congress of, Rac uh, of Racial Equality, to test um, uh, federal anti-segregation laws in the U.S. South uh, boarded Jewish-only buses in Jerusalem in order to challenge Israeli apartheid and the companies that run the transit system. Um, but what's interesting is that the parallels with the U.S. civil rights movement led um, the American media to make these Im immediate connections as if somehow what they were fighting for was for desegregation. So the Palestinian Freedom Riders then had to issue a press release clarifying that their goal was not desegregation, but decolonization. So what mattered most, though, to the Palestinian Freedom Riders was not the parallels or the analogies, but their insistence and correct insistence that their struggles were linked, not only to each other, but to injustice and oppression around the world. Uh, they echoed the same basic principles expressed by the Women of Color delegation to Palestine in 2011, uh, which Rabab organized in the, the, the Black for Palestine, uh, in the Movement for uh, Black Lives Solidarity Statements, uh, in the viral video project some of you have seen called When I See Them, I See Us, as well as that of other campaigns. And that is that justice is indivisible and global. It knows no boundaries. And it is founded not on shared experience, but shared principles. And that's really the theme. Not shared experience always, but shared principles. Um, the Palestinian freedom fighters, freedom riders, freedom fighters too, um, were right to acknowledge that a shared past, uh, that they shared a past. But it's a past that I would argue is more entangled than an analogous. In fact, the recent spectacular attacks on black activists and intellectuals advocating for Palestine, namely, and most of you know about this, CNN's firing of Mark Lamont Hill, uh, the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute's initial decision to deny Angela Davis uh, its highest honor, uh, the attacks on Michelle Alexander for her New York Times op-ed piece uh, criticizing Israel, the ongoing war on Minnesota Congresswoman Ilhan Omar uh, lay behind all those attacks they are really rich and complicated history that exceeds the politics of analogy. So each of these events pulls us back to the era surrounding 1967, when the convergence of black urban rebellions and the Arab-Israeli war birthed the first significant wave of black Palestinian, US black Palestinian solidarity uh, and signaled the, the demise of uh, the so-called uh, black Jewish alliance in the US. And the Black Jewish Alliance was based on this notion of a shared analogy of oppression rather than shared principles of liberation. And that's part of the attraction of, of Zionism. Third world insurgencies and anti-imperialist movements radically reordered political alliances between 1967 and the mid-1970s, contributing to, among other things, the emergence of third world studies and black studies. So what was being reordered was not just political alliances, but a vision of the world. The post-1967 radical insurgencies were more than a nationalist struggle 
or national struggles for a modern nation state as a path to decolonization, but um, it ought to be considered or understood to be world making. And this is a, a term that many people use. I'm referring to um, a book by Adam uh, Gedichu, who just came out. But it's, he, he argues that this is really world making rather than just nation building. Uh, behind these black expressions of solidarity of Palestine, I contend, lay a vision of world making rather than a politics of analogy or identity in that the eruption of post-1967 history into the present or present struggles to end occupation, dispossession, exploitation, and violence in Palestine and the US has been a catalyst for imagining revolution as opposed to plotting coalition. So with the time I have, I just want to look at two cases, Mark Lamont Hill and Angela Davis, we could talk about others. Okay, so November 30th, 2018, CNN fired Mark Lamont Hill for a speech he gave at the UN commemorating International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, which is held annually pretty much in recognition of the Nakba. Uh, Hill suggested that Israeli settlement policies left no alternative but a one-state solution based either on apartheid or on a democratic model of equality, citizenship, and full political rights for Palestinians. Of course, in this room, that's not a controversial position. Um, Hill's speech was powerful, it was evidence-based, it was judicious, um, and it left its critics with little with which to level the standard accusations of anti-Semitism. So what did they do? They zeroed in on one of his phrases, that is the phrase, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, simply because Hamas uses it. Now Hill survived the attack, you know the story, he has his reputation still intact. He has a university job. He doesn't work for CNN, which is okay. You know, <laughs> I'm not. I'm sad about that. Um, and he received overwhelming international support. Nevertheless, the controversy surrounding uh, Hill's speech is instructive. First, the phrase in question began, uh, and got to remember this, uh, began as a Zionist slogan, signifying the boundaries of what they deemed Eretz Israel. The Likud party's founding charter reinforces this vision in a statement that, quote, between the sea and the Jordan, there will only be Israeli sovereignty, okay? During the mid-60s, the PLO embraced a version of the slogan, but it meant something altogether different uh, from the Zionist vision of Jewish colonization. Instead, the Palestine National Council's charters of 1964 and 68 demanded, quote, the recovery of the usurped homeland in its entirety and its restoration of land and, land and rights, including the right of self-determination uh, to the indigenous population. In other words, the PNC was calling for decolonization, but this did not mean the elimination or exclusion of all Jews from the Palestinian nation, only the settlers. According to the 64 Charter, quote, Jews who are of Palestinian origin shall be considered Palestinians if they are willing to live peacefully and loyally in Palestine. Okay, so then the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, PFLP, uh, which embraced radical third world oriented nationalism and Marxism Leninism, envisioned a single democratic, potentially socialist Palestinian state in which all peoples would enjoy citizenship. Likewise, Fatah leaders shifted from promoting the expulsion of settlers to embracing all Jews as citizens in a secular democratic state. So by 1969, free Palestine from the river to the sea came to mean one democratic secular state that would supersede the exclusionary ethno-religious state of Israel. Although the unity around this position within, PLO, uh, within the PLO ultimately falls apart once uh, Arafat pursues a negotiated settlement with Israel for a separate uh, Palestinian state, the point I want to underscore is that the radicalization of the Palestinian movement between 1967 and the mid-70s coincides with the deepening ideological divisions in the black freedom movement. The PLO's left turn affected not only the Palestinian national movement, but the Arab student movement in the US. At its August 1967 convention, the uh, Organization of Arab Students endorsed resolutions declaring solidarity with black struggles in the US, with Africa, uh, and throughout the diaspora, the National Liberation Front in Vietnam, and the socialist countries supporting global revolutionary insurgencies. From their opening statement, 
the convention emphasized the indivisibility of all revolutionary anti-imperialist movements. So when we talk about this moment as a high point of black Palestine solidarity, we have to acknowledge that it was the black left, the black left, the political minority, that extended solidarity to a Palestinian left based on a radical anti-imperialist agenda. In fact, most black liberals and conservatives in that moment, 1970, were actually ramping up their support for Israel. On 28 June uh, 1970, for example, civil rights leaders A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin published a full page ad in the New York Times under the title, An Appeal by Black Americans for United States Support for Israel, signed by 64 Negro leaders, including Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, uh, people that we think of as now as progressive, uh, Congressman uh, John Conyers, Shirley Chisholm, which basically called on the U.S. to provide Israel with more jet fighter planes. That was the bottom line. It said you need to basically provide more jet fighter planes. In other words, this is an example of black leaders doing the work of promoting the foreign policy interests of another country. This is what Ilhan Omar is actually criticizing. Uh, the statement, among other things, rejected the argument that Palestinians under occupation face racial subjugation, a position that they called, uh, quote, not only uninformed, but dangerously misleading. And just the statement goes on to say, it ignores the fact that approximately half the Jewish Israeli population consists of immigrants from Asia and Africa. And it also implies that there is an inherent solidarity of non-white people. So this is a, the black liberal and conservative leadership pushing back against the idea that there's a kind of racial subjugation uh, in, uh, existing. Um, a few months later now, a coalition of black radicals formed a group called the Committee of Black Americans for Truth about the Middle East and published a withering critique of the statement that put out by um, uh, uh, Rustin and um, Randolph, and a critique of Zionism in the New York Times. The signatories were a veritable who's who of the black left, had Fran Beal um, and Gwen Patton of the Third World uh, Women's Alliance, uh, James and Grace Lee Boggs in Detroit, uh, Robert F. Williams, poets, artists, student activists, labor organizers, really a massive uh, a group of support. The opening sentence of that statement establishes the basis of solidarity on a shared struggle, quote, for self-determination and an end to racist oppression. The statement implicates the U.S. in the slaughter of Palestinian refugees in Jordan, which is linked to U.S. proxy wars in Southeast Asia, South Africa, Greece, and Iran. It characterized Zionism as, quote, a racist ideology that justifies the expulsion of the Palestinian people from their homes and lands in attempts to enlist the Jewish masses of Israel and elsewhere in the service of imperialism to hold back the Middle East Revolution. The statement situated the struggle of Palestine within a broader global anti-colonial anti revolution and called Israel a white settler state. This is 1970 comparable to South Africa and Rhodesia, and extended solidarity to Sephardic Jews, Native Americans, Puerto Ricans, Chicanos, and the Israeli left. It even quoted a document drafted by members of the Israeli Socialist Organization in 1966 committed to, quote, a de-Zionized Israel, the abolition of Jewish supremacy, and an anti-imperialist foreign policy actively supporting the forces struggling for socialism and unification in the Arab world. Now, Palestinian militants also uh, had begun to reach out directly to African Americans. In fact, about a week before the New York Times uh, uh, piece ran, the, the Randolph and Rustin piece, um, the Baltimore Afro-American, a black newspaper, published a profile of the PFLP militant Rod Abdul Wahad a Palestinian of African descent, born in Haifa, but forced by the Nakba into, the West, into a West Bank a refugee camp. He emphasized that resistance to the occupation was both a struggle against colonialism and racism, Jericho, Haifa, Jerusalem, and Gaza. And he talked about the racism they experienced in Israel. Uh, Wahad also acknowledged that he and his brothers, I mean his, his actual blood brothers, also PFLP uh, members, followed the black freedom movement in the U.S. closely. He says, quote, our struggle is the same. 
We in the PFLP are fighting racism and religious exclusivism. Our aim is to create a free Palestine in which um, uh, inquiry via international travel and under the pressure of state-sanctioned confinement. Um, and so her confinement, her experience as a political prisoner uh, suggested that uh, confinement, might, confinement alone wasn't necessarily the basis of solidarity. I actually talk about the, the 2016 delegation. I can't talk about that now, because I got about 30 seconds. So I'm gonna skip all that stuff. I'm gonna skip George Jackson. I'm gonna skip Enemy of the Sun. Believe it, it's, it's in here. And just say the very last part here. And give me 30 seconds. So um, in March 2018, a year ago, as part of the Teaching Palestine delegation, uh, we visited the Abu Jihad Museum for the Prisoners Movement in Nablus, and we saw the exhibition, um, George Jackson and the Son of Palestine. And this connects Angela Davis with, uh, with Jackson, uh, you know, with uh, the Black Panther Party. And what struck me most, however, was seeing uh, the Jackson exhibit in the context of all these images of Palestinian prisoners alongside their writings and artwork. Um, so I came away from the encounter convinced that it is not the condition of captivity that was the basis of solidarity, but the critique of captivity from a place of confinement. The critique that we associate with people like Antonio Gramsci, uh, with George Jackson, with Angela Davis, or with many others. The shared dreams of liberation, the mobilizing and planning to fulfill that dream. Here in a small underfunded museum in Annapolis, a city renowned for its fierce resistance to occupation, we encountered the afterlives of the post-1967 moment in imprisoned men and women who left a record of looking ahead in order to produce a radically different future. This was world making. What brought Palestinian and black activists together in that moment was not just a recognition of parallel oppressions, humiliations by violence and carcerality under occupation, but a shared vision of liberation a vision that extended beyond the nation state and even beyond the transnational to the world itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robin, for that uh, presentation and very um, motivational, inspiring, I think. Um, we know that you're becoming very South Africanized, Robin, because you almost got correct the names of my two colleagues, Matlasi and Matsidiso. If you can do that, you're South African. Um, our last speaker, last keynote speaker is uh, Rabab, Rabab Abdul Hadi. Uh, Rabab is a director and senior scholar in the Arab and Muslim Ethnicities and Diasporas um, Ahmed Studies Program, Associate of Ethnic Studies, Race Resistance Studies at the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University. She's also, um, um, Ahmed, the, the institution she heads, is also one of the four co-hosts of this uh, conference and, and the study tour that follows it. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, um, Ahmed, um, Affirmative Youth Center for hosting us here, and the organizers, the comrades who are here. I'm truly honored, not only to be in the company of these two amazing. Veronica Srin, the way we know about you is that you were a leader of Ubuntu Osiso, at, of the ANC. So this is kind of like, and then the second aspect of it is the history that you had. It's very important for Palestine. The history of actually people who are participating against what is supposed to be their interests and their communities in the struggle of justice for all in South Africa. And this is very important because it's very important in the project for the liberation of Palestine to think about who can be and how can Israeli Jews participate actually in the project of the liberation of Palestine. So this is quite, it's an honor and I will stop at that because I will take all my time and don't start counting. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the second is, is Robin. Robin has been historically very much committed to the project of justice way before a lot of the things became fashionable. Robin has participated with us and actually has gone at his own expense to Palestine last year. He's been speaking as you've heard. And also, both of them has taken a lot of the stuff that I was going to say, so I, it gives me more time to say other things. But I'm also, I also want to honor all the heroes and heroines and everybody who has fought for justice anywhere, starting with the people here in South Africa whose struggle is very inspiring to us, regardless of all the critiques 
that people in South Africa make and people around the world. And we make these critiques both in response and as a call, as a response to the call of South Africans who are fighting day in and day out to finish the incomplete project of ending what began and also in a spirit of solidarity and comradeship in which we participate in making these critiques and in particular forums where we can make these critiques. So it's, I'm very, very honored to be here. I also wanted to mention two very important anniversaries. One of them is Naeem reminded us of last night that in three days is going to be the anniversary of Sharpeville Massacre, Sharpeville Uprising and Sharpeville Massacre here in South Africa. It's also the anniversary of al karama battle in uh, Palestine, al which was a very turning point on March 21st, 1968, and we commemorated that last year, was very, very important battle, not only in the sense that a bunch of Palestinian freedom fighters along with some elements of the Jordanian army. And by the way, if you go to the Jordanian government's website, they claim all of the, all of the credit for this very, very interesting. And even of course, I was looking at the what they're saying. But it was actually people who came together and defeated the might of the Israeli military machine. So there are multiple lessons to be learned here and to actually think about what is it that we do when we do scholarship? What is it that we do when we do, do, do teaching? Was it, what is it that we do when we do advocacy? How do we learn from all of these things? How do we think about all these examples in history? And think about how do we use them in order for us to teach? People always say Israel is invincible. Yet here are just beginning a militant freedom movement. Beginning, it was 1968. Yes, the PLO was founded in 1964, but it was funded by the Arab League. And it took a very long time until 19 after 67 for the PLO to be taken over by the Palestinian faction. Not that the history did not begin much earlier, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But that was the time when Israel, actually the Israeli mighty force was defeated. And if we go every single time and look at the history of Palestinians, of Lebanese, of the, the, the Israeli withdrawal of Gaza in 2005, of the Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon in 2000, Every single time, Israel, except for parts of Sinai, which Israel still controls, co-controls with Egypt, Israel was forced to withdraw because of the power of people on the grassroots and international solidarity, which is also a lesson that Vietnam teaches us, that it is the people's determination on the ground to fight, along with international solidarity. So it becomes also a very important topic for us to take us up in our academic circles and in our pedagogical circles and not leave it outside to some activist places, and radical places where we can speak about it here and there sporadically, uh, accidentally, uh, occasionally, but actually becomes really a very big part of our project that we don't need to make any apologies for. Okay, so, now my paper begins. <laughs> so I'm going, I'm going to talk about a few points. One is that why what, what, what is the genealogy and the, and, the, and the challenges of the project that we started teaching Palestine? And it actually really started in 2016, and there were two very important things happening at that time. One was Palestinian, Palestinians everywhere, actually initiated by Palestinians in Britain and embraced by people everywhere It became the Palestinian National Committee, were thinking about how do we mark the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. That was in spring 2016. And one of the reasons a lot of us started thinking about this, and it's really important because there were, it was also the 50th anniversary of the 1967 occupation coming up. And some of us were quite concerned that the focus is only going to be on the 67 occupation. And thus the discourse of how do we think about Palestine will be limited to producing and the end, quote unquote, the two state solution in the West Bank and Gaza, which then is not about the solutions itself, and it's not about statehoods per se, because the Palestinian resistance did not begin as thinking about states and countries, and so it began to think about liberation, it's about anti-colonial resistance. What happens then, what the outcome is, is another question. But there was a very big concern that when people think about 19, 2017, the 50th anniversary of 67, the only discussion remains about the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. And the discussion of Palestinians, who have been dispossessed and displaced in 59 refugee camps, not all of them continue to exist, throughout the region, and Palestinians in Israel, who are supposed to have Israeli citizenship, but are also subjected to an apartheid-like regime, or we can 
arguments whether it does or it doesn't, but a very systemic system of discrimination and so on will be forgotten completely. And we will not be talking about from the river to the sea and the transnational Palestinian diaspora. We will only be talking about basically what amounts to a Swiss cheese, West Bank, which is buckled with multiple Israeli colonies called settlements in legal term, and then people will forget. So one of the main reasons to actually think about teaching Palestine and think about is to challenge the narrative that existed at the time and think about how do we shift it from only talking about 50 years of occupation to also talking about 100 years of Balfour, the role of colonial powers, imperialist power, including Britain, in subjugating Palestine. How do we think about the Palestinians, the Palestinian various areas of geographies of disposition, not only in one place, how do we think about them that we don't say, okay, one, two, three, four, but we actually think about them in their totality, despite the different experiences that exist, specifically the totality in the struggle itself. And then we also wanted to think about what are other anniversaries existing at that time, in terms of uh, Palestinian history. We had the Nakba coming up in 2018, which is the great march of return in Gaza, ended on May 15, 2000. Uh, 18. We had the anniversary, the 35th anniversary of the Sabra and Shatila massacre, which was very important in September, specifically to also talk about both the collusion of some Arab forces in the massacring and the, the, the threat, attempt to eliminate and liquidate the Palestinian cause, but also the Arab people who also stood by the Palestinians and fought together jointly, not as an act of charity and solidarity, but as an act of inter in interlink and very much organic, organically dialectical relationship between Palestinian movement and, and Arab movements. So those were really important to think about. The other aspects to think about that were anniversaries was the 10th anniversary of the blockade of Gaza, which for specific reasons in 2017 was completely erased from the historical memory and not talked about when people are talking about Palestine and solidarity with Palestine. And that also satisfies different other uh, agendas, including secular fundamentalism, which is, I mean, Islamophobia. But I'm not going to get into it too much because I would not have enough time. We can, we can discuss it uh, later on. There were multiple anniversaries. There was the partition, November 29th, the 2017-70th anniversary, the Yassin massacre in April, and so on and so forth. So by thinking about multiple anniversaries, we are reminding people that there is a very rich history. That it is not what people say the first intifada, uh, December 9, 9, 1987. It was actually an intifada, 1987, because there were multiple anniversaries. And we actually, if we talk about Balfour, we can also bring in the history of the 1936-39 revolt and talk about the ways in which Palestinians have resisted historically. So in a sense, it was to shift the way in which Palestine is being messaged, imagined, and framed, number one. And secondly, to shift the discourses and the narratives of subjugation, submission, and defeat that colonial powers were, Im were imposing, and I don't need to go into many examples, but if you look at all the coverage of the 50th anniversary of 67, of Nakba, of this and that, you will see how these, uh, the, how these narratives of sub submission, subjugation, and defeat are being uh, propagated. We, can, but this, that we have a lot, and I've spoken about this a lot, and many people have, so we can discuss it further on, but to also think about how do we then also talk about the narratives of resistance and liberation and solidarity. So we're not only talking about how colonial powers need to subjugate, colonize people, marginalized communities, but also what makes for liberation and resistance, and how solidarity really becomes internationalism, and I'm saying internationalism, which is very different than transnationalism, it's two different things. Transnationalism would apply to the Palestinian. Palestine has always been transnational, imagine. But, and there are Palestinian organizations like, you know, Lumnas, if you talk about that, that actually have a transnational connection and so on. Historically, Palestinian movement has always been that. But internationalism, and it was, it was not internation. I am talking about the groups that have actually organized, either officially within countries, like OSPA, Organization of Solidarity with the People of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, or we're talking about AFSO, Afro-Asian uh, People's Solidarity, and many other forums were for formally organized, but there were also many other ways in which the history of the Palestinian movement, in which Palestinians actually embrace other movements, and other movements embrace Palestinians. In a sense, Vietnam factors a lot in the history of Palestine, and that also becomes a way to understand 
why is Vietnam? Why does Vietnam and how does Vietnam factor? And does Vietnam factor the same way as, for instance, in the US, which is a very different way of imagining and thinking about it and analyzing because the, the, the relationships and the, and the solidarities and the South-South relations and so on are very different than that. So this was one main reason why we actually started teaching Palestine. The other thing also in 2016, we had another historical moment. We were actually at San Francisco State University. We were thinking, how do we commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Palestinian Cultural Mural, honoring the late Professor Edward Said. I'm not going to give away, I'm not going to steal your thunder, Said. It's your paper. But, I, uh, but we were trying to think, what do we do? This is coming up also in 2017. How do we mark that? Especially because we talk about the spirit of 68. And San Francisco State University, for people who do not know, has been the seat where students in 1968, led by the Black Student Union, who are members of the Black Panther Party, by the way, okay, it wasn't just, it was, it was the people we're talking about. And as well as the Third World Liberation Front, so with, this is where Third World Liberation comes up, came together and led the longest student strike in the history of the United States, demanding the decolonizing of the curriculum, demanding the representation and the validation of experiences of marginalized communities, demanding a very different way of thinking about teaching inside and outside of the university. We're setting up something called experimental college, talking about how people from the community can come and actually teach people at the university and how people at the university need to be actually linked to the community. In other ways, we're not the only ones who are invested with knowledge. And we're not the only ones who have the first and the last word of knowledge. Because public intellectuals and engaged organic intellectuals exist everywhere. And from the Palestinian experience, historically, public intellectuals have been actually very involved in the question of teaching Palestine before the actual project named Teaching Palestine came to exist. So it's also very important to actually think about genealogies in those sense and, and linking them up to our current. And that, the other thing about San Francisco State University is that everybody talks about 1968, but people talk mostly about Columbia University, Paris, 1968, you see Berkeley free speech movement, but the lesser public education universities where there was a lot, University of Mexico, the Senegal, Tunisia, uh, the, the, the organizing in France was not actually only students. There was a worker student. There was a movement that, set, that basically stopped the whole world at that point and challenges. So how do we understand all of these things without actually coming up with catchphrases? where we say 68 and then we talk about 1, 2, 3, 4 and not really get into what this means and how is it in the telling of the narrative we do not end up disempowering the very communities about whom we're making these narratives. So this is, this, these two historical moments came about. The other thing I talk about, okay, how am I doing for time so I can budget the rest of my talk? Six minutes? Okay. All right. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about is also the roots which I mentioned the roots of the Palestinian uh, teaching Palestine. Historically, I think everybody who's familiar with Palestine knows that Palestinians place a very big emphasis on education. Not because there is a special thing, exceptionality about Palestinians, that Palestinians have different genes or DNA or whatever, but because when you get displaced, the only thing you can take with you is your education. And every single Palestinian knows, your parents tell you, it's the only thing you can take with you. You can't even take a passport. You may carry the key, but the key doesn't take you anywhere else except reminding you of the need to write of return. But the education is very, very important. But also, it's not only this cliche. It's also the fact that Palestinian intellectuals and leaders have been engaged in teaching Palestine in very pedagogical, very critical, very challenging ways, in ways that we don't think about, about them as intellectual. We know that Hassan Kanafan and Majid Abu Sharar and Wa'il Zaita, where the main, many of the Palestinians who were assassinated, and there is a reason why Israel assassinated them, to take away, to take away the people who are actually uh, entitled, entailed with the producing knowledge. But they weren't only the only people who were there, there were other people who were known as leaders that are not seen as producers of knowledge, but they were actually very much engaged in the production of knowledge. And I will mention in those names Dalal al-Mughrabi, I will mention Shadi Abu Ghazali. I mention Aisha Oda that many people do not know about her book that she wrote about the torture of Rasmiya Oda in prison. And it's not even translated, it's not even available in English. There are a few things that are available. Also, it's not really, the other thing is not, it's not really that important if everything gets translated to English. 
It's good because you want to build the solidarity movement, but it's not as important what is produced in the local context for the people who are organizing. And going by what Ronnie was saying about the importance for the people to resist. Correct leadership, we're not there, but, but it's really, really important. That's what happens in your argument when you talk about the four pillars of boycott and so on. You say about people resisting first, and then you build international solidarity, which is also the lesson of the Vietnamese. They also have participated in many ways in teaching Palestine. We can expand upon that. But also in the ways in which the Israeli government has systematically destroyed all aspects of knowledge production among Palestinians, from stealing the archives in 1982 when it invaded Lebanon, to stealing, there is 100,000 documents prisoners have that Israel still holds for Palestinian prisoners that refuses to, when we went to the Abu Jihad Museum, the director was there, refuses to surrender. We're talking about the raids that they go every single day. We're talking about one million high school diplomas that were taken in, after Aqsa Intifada when Israel raided the Palestinian city. There is multiple examples about the destruction of knowledge that is very systemic, that has to do uh, with this project. So this is, has been going on, and I'm, I'm not going to go uh, talk about all of the, the histories of solidarities against the Baghdad, Baghdad the way that actually they began at uh, institutions of higher learning, from Cairo University where Arafat and other people were, to American University of Beirut where George Habash and Wadi Haddad, and, and so on and so forth. All of this stuff is actually, there is a history, rich archive, rich data that exists, that is saying, that is crying for it to be discussed, to be learned about, to be analyzed, to be presented to the world. So one of the things, so um, the, 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 the next thing is that, what, what is it, so why do we commemorate anniversaries? I talked about that. So the next uh, question for me, let me just see what I can say in the short period that I have left. Okay. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very disciplined. Yeah. Three minutes, okay. So the next, uh, the, the, the next question, okay, so one, so we talk about the genealogy, we talked about the development of the project. We actually had, and let me just share with you, and I think this is this also this is some of the stuff that Rani and Robin talked about, is that we've actually had uh, implemented Teaching Palestine. The first project, the first time we've done it was in, in Palestine. We did actually a small uh, conversation, thematic conversation, the Middle East Studies Association, and actually in 2017 we did a whole forum all day teaching Palestine at the left forum in Europe, all day of, and all of it is available by the way online because this is the only way we can communicate with people and make things available, we have no, we have no resources, so this is the way you get the world to know what's going on. But we also took Palestine to Cuba and we went and we presented at the Caribbean Studies Association. During that time we were able to go to visit Tricontinental and OSPA and look at the archives and learn about, I mentioned El Karama, and learn about actually Cubans who went and fought with the Palestinians in Karamba Battle. That is not even known yet. That is something that actually also asking for it to be learned. We went, we went in, in, in Montreal, we actually had one of the owners and the organizers of the Black Letter, Insula Dirty, Sam Anderson and Rosemary Miller, who were involved with the Black Panther Party, actually speak about their experiences on the anniversary of the 35th anniversary of the, of the Sabra al-Shatila massacre, along with members of the Jews for, against the Israeli massacre in Lebanon, who were also very organized. And the reason I'm mentioning these things is that, because sometimes people think, whether solidarity activists or scholars, we mention certain things because we just want to make points that we are overreaching. We are making points that are not really the reality. We should just give it up. I mean, this is part of the submission subjugation in the field. But it's actually, we do have a very rich archive about people coming together, organizing, resisting, being resilient, and continuing what they are doing. And the fact that this archive is not known is also part of perpetuating the narratives of subjugation, submission, and defeat. And that becomes really important to talk about that, yes. Uh, to, talk, to, to also be part of the things that we will uh, bring out and, uh, and discuss. So the question is now, is, and the two minutes that are remaining, what are the challenges? What do we do with that? Where do we go from here? And I want to just raise some questions that I think really important for us to think about. The question first is, who, what counts? What counts as scholarship? What counts as pedagogical praxis? Where does pedagogical praxis take place? Praxis, I mean, praxis comes from branches. So it's a, it's a, it's a Marxist term. Where does it come from? It was not invented 
in only in a classroom in an elite university. It was, it was something that people, organizers always thought, analyzed, talked about, had learned history, and then went on to have action. Um, this has always been part of the, the, the history. The second question is that who is at the center of analysis? When we are analyzing, who, what kind of uh, analysis we are providing? A lot of the times we hear about the 50th anniversary of 67 or the 100th anniversary of Balfour, and it's most of the time it is dominant-centric analysis, whether it is imperialist, US, British, or it is Israeli-centric analysis. The story is not heard from, let's say, a Palestinian-centric analysis, or from the analysis of marginalized communities. So then the conclusions that come out of that analysis provide a narrative of submission, subjugation, and defeat, and actually lead you to ask questions that it is not the people who are marginalized asking these questions. It's actually the oppressors who are asking these questions. And then you, as homogenized communities, are obligated to answer those questions, either in a multiple choice form, or worse yet, is to actually, so what do you do? How do you go? This is what's going on. What do you do about it? And if we reframe the question and put place at the center of analysis, marginalized communities, in this case, Palestinians, then it, be, it yields very different results. Okay. The, 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 yeah. the, uh, the, the, the third point that I wanted to mention is that, is then how do we teach this? How do we teach it at what, what counts as some of our, our material? And finally, once we do all of this research, what do we do with it? Is it enough to teach in the, in the academy? Is it enough to do the scholarship? Is it enough to learn? For what purpose we know what we know? And whose interest does it benefit? Is it enough if we do not actually do things that lead ultimately to change in the world? So if we are saying, why Palestine? Why South Africa? Why the spirit of 68? It all boils down to the question of the indivisibility of justice. That we cannot, Palestine stands for justice. Palestine does not stand for a nationalist narrow nationalist confined project, stands for justice. Why South Africa? Because it makes a lot of sense to come here and learn and have discussions and with each other have this reciprocal critical analysis. And why is it that we need to do all of this? Because if we do not have the framework of the indivisibility of justice, we will not be able to answer many intellectual and pedagogical and practical questions we need to do. And when we know all of the stuff, we really need to make that a real praxis. We need to come together, we need to build movement, agree and disagree, fight with each other, debate, yell at each other, and at the end of the day say, tomorrow we go and we build another world. Amandla. Thank you very much, Rabab. Um, thank you to all three of our speakers. We do have some time left for some questions, comments, uh, whatever, for the next 20 minutes or so. So let's kick that off. Oh, OK, we can have a longer tea break. Yeah. Hi, uh, Robin. Um, sorry. Okay. Well, this question is for Robin in re reference to the 1970 letter by the liberal uh, black uh, representation, especially led by Bayard Rustin, who was a pacifist. And the ironic contradiction, if you can speak about it, the fact that he was advocating armaments for Israel, what the contradiction reflected beyond the fact of the uh, biblical association or the identity with Zionism. But that particular point, it's something maybe we could expand upon. Thank you. Um, let, let's, let's, take, let's take a round of uh, three or so questions. Please keep your questions and comments uh, short. Thanks for the good example, uh, Jaime. Uh, Matsuri, sir. Long comments will be cut off. Try to be very brief. Um, thanks to the three speakers. My question is really to Comrade Ronnie Castles. Um, you spoke about the dominant, very dominant religious narrative, especially amongst you know, um, the black um, people in South Africa, but how do we go about re-educating? I mean, this is a conference about teaching, and how do we teach Palestine, especially in the South African context, 
where when we try to teach Palestine, this is constantly the block that we, we face. And um, I mean, you know, I'm not a very huge religious person. I should have really listened in my Sunday school classes. But um, I've, I, I find that in my work as, 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 you know, someone who works in the Palestine space, that um, narrative seems to constantly emerge. And I, you know, it's a huge struggle in the South African context. And perhaps um, Comrade Rooney can expand a little bit further on that. Matsidiso, you do know that we have we also have a whole session on the religious uh, issue. Um, to be fair, the next question should be for Rabab. Yes, Mia. Uh, thank you, Rabab. Thank you for your talk. It was really inspiring. Um, um, can, can you stand, please? Oh, sure. Um, and, and give us your name. Okay. Um, so I am um, Professor Mia Swart. Um, I'm a professor in international law, and I've done considerable field work in Palestine. So I'm interested in what you what you said about you know South Africa as a sort of a form of inspiration or a model or that it's appropriate to come here. You know, increasingly, I am so despondent about that idea. I feel that, you know, anyone who's really in touch with the, this, the extent to which we've been betrayed by the governing party, which is currently being investigated by the Zondo Commission, would actually not think so anymore. I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's time for a bit of less euphoria and a bit, a bit more realism in that regard. Yes. Thank you. Rob, do you want to kick off? Okay, I know, very, very quickly, um, yes, it's ironic, uh, and among the signatories to that letter was Dr. King Sr., who also identified himself as nonviolent. Um, so that's, that's, that's just simply me stating the obvious. I just want to add one other thing, that there's another letter uh, that preceded that one from 1967 that Dr. King, uh, the junior, actually signed on to, his, which basically made the same case, that the defense of Israel, uh, which is a military defense, uh, needs to be supported. And, and King himself later, I write about this in a longer version of the piece that's coming out in the Journal of Palestine Studies, uh, King actually said he never read the document. He, he said he signed on to it, he regretted it, and then sort of pulled back to I don't, I can't believe that's in there. Because he, they called him to task on this very, very issue. Uh, but this is part of the problem, is a kind of knee-jerk response. Um, and the fact that the, the statement is actually very explicit in terms of what it's calling for. It's not even calling in a general sense of the defense of Israel. It's saying, you need to send more weapons. And that, of course, um, causes a lot of us to, to raise questions about not just Rustin, but the civil rights movement's uh, claims to, to pacifism and to nonviolence. Okay. Well, 